My name is Enid Slack, and I'm the director of the Institute on Municipal Finance and Governance here at the Monk School of Global Affairs. Uh, on behalf of Alan Broadbent, who's the chair of our board, and our board and staff at IMFG, I'm pleased to welcome you here today to the session on land value capture. Uh, I am uh, truly impressed by the number of you who made it through the snow to get here, and we're delighted that you're all here. Uh, today's event is being co-sponsored with the International Property Tax Institute and the Center for Urban Research and Land Development at Ryerson University. I would like to thank our co-sponsors for their collaboration and also for their participation on the panel this afternoon. We're hosting this panel discussion on land value capture because it has become a pretty hot topic in Toronto, especially when we talk about funding new transit lines. Yet, we really don't know all that much about it, what it is and how it works and whether it can really bring in the revenues we need to pay for transit or other infrastructure in the city. So our three organizations thought it would be a good idea to hear from people who do know something about land value capture and who can tell us where it has worked and frankly where it hasn't worked and what we can expect. To moderate the panel discussion this afternoon, I would like to introduce Paul Sanderson. Paul is the President and CEO of the International Property Tax Institute. Uh, before becoming President of IPTI, uh, Paul was, the director, uh, was a director at the UK Valuation Office Agency. For those of you who don't know what that is, that's kind of the UK version of MPAC, the Municipal Property Assessment Corporation here in Ontario. Paul was responsible for providing professional advice and technical guidance on valuation and property issues. And Paul has consulted on property tax issues around the world, and I think he's even given a few talks on land value capture himself. So please welcome Paul Sanderson. Well, thanks, Enid, and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Can I also uh, add my appreciation to Enid's for those of you who have battled through the snowy conditions, uh, I was advised that uh, this was you know, going to be the middle of winter here in Canada. And I said, not a problem. I'm from the UK. We're pretty tough guys. But I have to say, there's no way that I can survive outside for more than about five minutes without 57 layers of clothing. And the Canada geese clothing is in particularly uh, hot demand at this time of the year. So uh, anyway... I'm delighted to welcome you all. Let me just tell you a little bit very briefly about the International Property Tax Institute. It is a not-for-profit organization with experts from around the world in all aspects of property tax, and that includes land value capture. As Enid says, I've been fortunate enough to have been invited to express some views about land value capture in various parts of the world. And, of course, I come from the UK where some of you will be aware We've had a, a wonderful history of dismal failure in trying various schemes of land value capture. But we do have one scheme at the moment which appears to be working. Some of you may have heard of Crossrail in London, which is the largest construction scheme currently uh, being undertaken within Europe. And it does raise funds from a variety of property owners through different uh, means of uh, land value capture. So if we have time later, uh, and if it's appropriate, I may tell you uh, a little bit more about that. But really my job here this afternoon is to introduce our two speakers, and we are indeed very fortunate to have two of the world's leading experts on land value capture here with us in Toronto. Martin Smolker is a director at the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy, and he's based in Boston but focuses on the Latin American program, where he not only directs research and educational programs, uh, but also has written some uh, many papers uh, on the issue of land value capture, one of which at least was written in uh, partnership with his uh, co-speaker here this afternoon, David Amborski. David, I'm sure, will be very familiar to many of you here in Toronto because he's a professor at the School of Urban and Regional Planning at Ryerson University and director of the Centre for Urban Research and Land Development. So, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, would you please join me uh, in welcoming Martin Smolker. Martin. All right, so, hello, uh, good afternoon. I'm glad to make out of uh, the snow last night. <laughs> and I got here a little bit late, but it's okay. And uh, I would like to thank very much for Aeneid and Paul and, 
and Jerry for the opportunity to be here, and of course, my dear friend David. Um, I'll be talking um, about uh, value capture, but with a, a focus on Latin America. I'm sorry, I'm not going to do much of what is happening in Europe or US. Um, David, I guess, is going to cover this with much more expertise than I do. And um, I do, um, I, I'm quite ignorant about what's it's happening here in Canada. <laughs> so David is going to cover on that. And I understand there is some, uh, some uh, interest, special interest in the transportation and components of that or the applications of that. I will mention some of that in Latin America and I hope that may be of some use. Um, so um, I will uh, uh, first talk about uh, some antecedents to that, that uh, clearly it's not a, uh, a new idea. It has been around for quite some time. I'm going to show that. And, and it often is being done without people even noticing it. It's a, just a, a good sense. Um, I'm going to talk about some justifications for that as a no-brainer, apparently. And why has it become it's, uh, it's getting uh, more popularized now? And then uh, make some comments about the different types of instruments that have been used in different parts of the world, in, in particular in Latin America, actually. And, and then uh, I'm going to cover um, a few experiences with particular emphasis on, the, uh, on a, a very um, innovative and very uh, interesting instrument that is being used in Sao Paulo nowadays and that has uh, been quite effective in, uh, in funding infrastructure. And, uh, and this is called the CPAC. So I'll, I'll, I'll get back to that. So um, going to the um, definition of it. Now, value capture refers to the recovery by the public of the land value increments, unearned in income, if you want, or plusvalias as is normally known in Latin America, generated by actions other than that the landowners direct investments. So the notion here is that the landowners actually, uh, um, most of these increments result from actions that are not uh, um, done by the uh, landowners. Typically, land value increases by something that happens outside. I can actually defy any of you to um, give me a good example of how can you appreciate buy a piece of land and for 100 and make it value 120 or 200 anything like that is absolutely nothing you could do about that it's most of it you say well I can I can flatten the land I can do that well this is mostly capital investment this is not changing the nature of the attributes of the land itself the only example that I that some extent that it comes close to how a landowner could actually increase its own land value is in large scale urban operations where you, it's, the city gets involved, we get a piece, a, a considerably a big uh, track of land in the city, and that redevelopment generates so many externalities to the city as a whole that some of that kick back to the area, and that appreciates that land. But other than that, I don't know of any other example, at least from, from, the, from the strict uh, logical point of view. So um, it has a long uh, standing present in legal and the planning agenda. Um, since the 16th century, the Philippines and Manolins uh, um, ordinances um, had already some of these schemes to so finance some of the uh, uh, some uh, public works uh, at the time. In 1791, an architect in France actually proposed. He was um, he was a, a, a was preceded a, a houseman, and he made a proposal for the assembly at the time to, to do a, a major reform of Paris, funding basically with the land value increments resulting from that, uh, from, the, uh, from these changes of land uses there. And um, it didn't get uh, very far, but houseman that took over that project uh, tried to do that, and at least 20% of, uh, of most of his uh, investments in, in Paris and most of his reforms was actually funded by by some kind of a land value increment that was resulting from, from the, uh, from the uh, um, changes that he was um, promoting there. Um, there are some reasons we can come back to that on explaining why, why, that, why was that, uh, and why is that he had some, some, some difficulties there, and it has to do with, with the, um, well, some political economy of the, at the time, but not, and not very, very legal ones, actually. Yeah. Um, most recently, there are a number of places that um, that played with, have been playing with that. Um, Germany is actually one of the, the places where land readjustment started almost 200 years ago. 
Uh, France had been done a lot. Japan, well, Nagoya, for instance, 95% of the redevelopment of the uh, of the reconstruction after the uh, the war in Nagoya was funded by land readjustment schemes. Just to give you an example of, uh, I don't know much about Canada. I know that that Dave is going to cover this. Uh, in Latin America, there is a lot of precedents also from a long time ago. Um, the Bridge of the Commons, this is the photo there. That was, was built with money collected from Betterment contributions at the time. This was, we're talking about 1809. Um, 1909, Sao Paulo has some schemes of pavement. Uh, it's almost every country, if you really look carefully, almost in every country in the world, there is something has been done and rely on some scheme. Sometimes it's even unnoticed. People don't even know that they're doing it, and they do just as a common sense thing. In Honduras, for instance, there, uh, there's interesting experience actually still nowadays, in, in, uh, for instance, in San uh, Pedro Sula. Um, and this, uh, um, this idea has been around for some time. And, and actually in the Vancouver, this is the habit that the first uh, um, International uh, big meeting of Habitat next year. We're having Habitat Three in in, uh, in Quito, actually, and uh, there was a, f a very powerful declaration at the time. And let, let me just go go th that just for the sake of a. Uh, I have some hi hyper hyperlinks here. I'm going to go into some of them. Otherwise, I won't go. I won't do my time here. So, <laughs> and I know that Paul is going to be uh, be a very uh, uh, very strong on, on keeping me in uh, in time. Um, but um, the unearned increment resulting from the rise in land values, resulting from the change in, in use of land, from public investment or decision. Notice this is not only from investment, from changes in land use decisions also. Uh, this is administrative acts. Uh, or due to general growth of the community must be subject to appropriate recapture by public bodies, the community, unless the situation calls for other additional measures such as new patterns of ownership, new general acquisition by land, by land, public, uh, um, land by the public bodies and so forth. So it's, uh, this notion is, I mean, I just, I hope I'm making the case that this is not anything new. It's not anything that, that only a few places are doing it. There are some, some, some crazy heads doing this, this in some, some areas. This has been around quite a bit. Quite for so long time, a long time, and there are many reasons why you do that. There are efficiency criteria for that. Um, the, the, even the, the most most uh, most uh, um, conventional economists would would have some some uh, um, some sympathy for that notion uh, on the basis that if you impose a marginal cost of society, you should you should uh, um, you should compensate that. And actually, uh, if you there is a long list. I'm not going to go to that list, but there's a long list of economists, Nobel Prize economists have very, very uh, uh, um, definitive uh, um, remarks regarding the um, appropriateness of land value taxation of some kind, of why taxing land value. And value capture is nothing more than that also. So uh, I'm not going to that, go there, that, otherwise I won't finish this thing in time. Um, here's, uh, by the way, uh, um, um, I, I, I was not going to say that. But now I am, since uh, Indy told me that about plus values. And, and there is this Alejo Carpentier, the uh, Cuban. Um, he, he was a essayist, a novelist, and a very famous uh, at the time. And he has, he has this famous say, he said, well, there are two things that move the word, sex and plus values. So we, we're doing at least plus values tonight. <laughs> we leave sex for the other time. Uh, um, but um, anyway. Um, equity reasons are very, very easy to understand. Uh, um, uh, uh, this is basically, uh, um, and we, uh, the notion is here is that you don't capture value because you want to penalize whoever is getting something. You, you try to capture something because you're giving something to someone and not to the others. That is, the, that is a fair thing. It's an a equity thing in that, in that sense, that you cannot, the public cannot benefit one and not the others. And that's the, the, this is the, the, the argument behind, the, the equity behind the value capture. Sustainability, well, this is the, note, uh, the idea uh, of financing urban development with the resulting land value appreciation. This is, this is sort, of, sort of almost in a homeostatic thing. 
and pragmatic. Um, and this is probably why many people are getting to that, and it has to do with the fiscal crisis and all that. People are looking for some local uh, sources of revenues, and value capture comes very neatly on that. Um, but um, the point here is that it's not necessary to raise funds. Right? You do value capital for a number of other reasons why you're, you're doing it. It's not necessarily only for raising funds. Um, I don't have to, I'm not going to go into these details, but there are a number, and most, I, I would assume that most of you are quite familiar with that, but a number of, of actions that are in the, in the cities, in cities that actually generate, generate a very handsome blend value increment. And we're talking about the urban motor play, for instance, when you convert rural to urban use, um, there's a, the typical uh, percentage that the urban multiplier, this is a sort of a standard in, in, in the words about 400 to 600 percent by simply, this is not putting a, a single, single uh, um, uh, uh, break on, 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 on the uh, on, on investment. This is simply by, by adding an administrative by just using the, the, the power of the mouse. You simply say this area can now be urban. By the simple fact that you announce that, the value goes up. Um, land development marks up to quite handsome also. Uh, just, uh, I'm not going to go on, on, on all that, but, uh, but uh, um, um, these, uh, the land value, um, the, simply the, the value of building rights is tremendous also. And, uh, um, and th these are things that, are, that, that none of these increments are accruing to landowners result from their own efforts. These are things that are done by third parties. And I'm, and I'm not going to go also, again, if I'm using this line, but I'm, I'm simply trying to, to go a, a little bit fast. Um, but if you see, these are very conservative numbers. If you, someone who owns a piece of land of 5,000 square meters, and you change, say, from rural to urban, you simply, this means that the municipality is simply giving a check of $40,000 for that landowner, or $400,000 if you, these are, Changing the land base land value from 100 to 180 percent of that is nothing, and, and, and these are very conservative values. And if you change the zoning regulations, and this is again, it's a very conservative. And actually, some of them are based in some of the some uh, actual numbers in Latin America. This is simply giving a million dollars, a check of a million dollars that the public is giving to the landowners simply by the fact of the the, the power of the mouse, right? Um, and here is a uh, the, uh, this notion of um, this is Donald Shoup is a um, some of you may know him from a, he's a uh, economist a, a uh, consultant for the World Bank and he, he asked a very very simple question why is it so hard to finance urban infrastructure that increases the value of service land by much more than the cost of infrastructure itself it's a no brainer right it should be it shouldn't be a problem and this is how to explain that uh, there, there are a number of reason or ways how you can explain that. But it simply, it's the idea of, of value capture. It shouldn't, we shouldn't have most of the problems that we typically have on financing of infrastructure, if that would hold. And um, here are some, some actual numbers, but um, again, um, you can see from, from here that the, 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 uh, the cost, the, these are real numbers from, from a major study done by the, the World Bank, actually, uh, of how much the, does it, oh, sorry. Um, the the, um, the increase in land values by adding some of these infrastructure uh, uh, components, so paving water in different parts of the city, pavement, plumbing, and so forth, sewage, I, I guess. Um, the only the only area that that does not increase the value more than investment costs is with sewage system actually after a certain distance from the center. And this has to do with people doing their own, their own uh, septic uh, um, uh, wells. Um, anyway, um, growing population, uh, um, there are a number of, oh, sorry, this is a very sensitive thing here. Um, it's uh, a number of new urban legislation in uh, taking this very explicitly nowadays. There is this famous, uh, um, Law 388 of Colombia in 1997, very explicit about value capture and why you do it and what to do with that and what they would proceed on that. The Brazilian law of 2001 is very effective, also very, has a lot of very, and actually it's much stronger than the Colombian, and, and, um, and I'll try to explain why. Uh, 
uh, Ecuador, Uruguay, Argentina, they're all, they're all beginning to, to, uh, to introduce that at the national level, uh, um, explicitly in the national level legislation. Um, and actually, you don't need that. Um, if you look carefully in most constitutions in, in most places of the world, you have this basic principle is there and it's almost everywhere. It's the principle of unjustified enrichment with no cause. This is basically what value capture is. If you take this, this constitutional principle at, at the, at, by the letter, you could always say, well, I, 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 have, I would always have a legal, legal coverage to do that. I don't need a specific law, but it's, this is a... Uh, at the end of the day, you, you, you could do that, right, if you wanted. Um, multilateral agencies are beginning to look very carefully on that. The IDB is doing a lot of studies recently on that. The World Bank have, have funded some of these studies. Habitat is, is going, going uh, uh, they're not ca calling it value capture, they're calling, they're calling value sharing, sort of more moderate thing, but it's the same thing. And uh, they don't want to sort of, a, uh, um, how do you say, hit the, the tiger with a with uh, with a short uh, stick, as you say. Uh, <laughs> um, the Economist actually has some some interesting has been coming on also on on, on that on that direction. Uh, let me just show this very quickly. There is an argument from in the in January the 11th um, uh, number. Uh, to that effect, the tax on, on the value of the land, it should be lower zero for agricultural land and would jump as soon as the permission to build is granted. It, um, it would prod builders to get uh, to work quickly. It would also help to capture the gains in houses, in house prices that result from investment in transport schools and transport or schools. So that even the economist is endorsing that. So if the economist is endorse, endorsing that, uh, I guess it's, it's okay, right? <laughs> Financial Times has done recently as well, uh, uh, and I'm not going to read it, uh, but I'm going to show that, that, that they, this is a, uh, a week ago, that they also can, uh, had a why Britain's broken planning system means the local people miss out. Uh, um, and um, you could read that. Now. Um, there are some books specifically on, on the, uh, oh shoot, sorry, I don't know what's going on here. Uh, okay, here we go. Some books are specific on the transportation thing that, uh, that that is taking explicitly the issue of how to use, a, how to apply value capture to transportation investments. Well, value capture tools comes like pasta in many, uh, in many uh, ways. Um, you could do it through taxes, you could do some regulatory, there are a number of instruments that are strictly regulatory, fees, partnerships, and, and others. And um, here's an example, some, a list of cases just for uh, illustrating each of them in, for cases in Latin America. For instance, land value tax. Well, there, there's, there are places that are actually collecting value capture, uh, collecting land through uh, with a full land value tax. This is Mexicali, and you remember um, Paul in that conference in in uh, where, where was it Mexico that we Guadalajara. Yeah, there we go. Um, a, um, an additional a temporary property tax uh, rate increase in, in Buenos Aires. They funded the. Uh, the, uh, uh, the subway with an additional property tax for, since it's an investment that, that benefits everybody. Uh, Betterment contribution, while well, Bogota is collecting about a billion dollars in public works over them, they, they have this agenda of uh, about 10, 000, uh, um, for 10 years of public work, but it's one thing, that this, um, they, they keep on renovating that thing. So at the moment, they have about a billion dollars of, of worth of, of public works being funded by betterment contribution, and, uh, and, and people paid. Uh, is there, no, there's a lot of, of, of myths behind it. Linkage fees, well, many, this is how uh, in Brazil what we got it started in selling building rights, and so this is where the, the whole conversation started, and it has to do with, with selling additional building rights over and above what the, the planning zone would, would establish. And this is, uh, didn't work very well. This was used originally by a very rightist, if you want, a, a mayor of Sao Paulo, as a way of sort of um, to, uh, um, to uh, um, address or to deal with the favelas, well-located favelas. Well, we would give you, release that land, and you give you, if you, uh, um, if you build some, some, 
social housing somewhere else, we release that land for you for, the, for whatever you want to do there. And this is, uh, and then they, uh, this thing is uh, uh, proliferated very fast because developers were very interested in, the, in, in that instrument. But it didn't, didn't generate that much. In Sao Paulo, for instance, it generated about $150 million just on linkages at the time. Um, regulatory, CPACs are clear, I'm not going to, it be uh, explained. Uh, um, I'm not going to explain this now because I want to sort of uh, highlight this in the uh, in uh, towards the end of this this talk. Um, but um, a number of, of urban operations. Urban operations are basically taking a big uh, track of land of the city and redeveloping it. And that and there is an instrument that is being being used there to to fund that. Um, exactions. This is probably the most most known instrument you know, throughout Latin America, or I guess even throughout the world. And in Guatemala, for instance, that is a, one of the most private countries in the world. I guess uh, the, uh, um, GD, uh, the um, public participates about 11% of GDP. It's very low. And they, they're doing this for transportation things. Uh, basically, the interesting thing about the, the way they, they collect exactions there is that they have the, uh, uh, the private developer actually having to do the public work directly. They don't sub high. And they, they, they found out that they, they would do cheaper, better, and faster uh, uh, with that scheme. It's pretty interesting. Uh, land readjustment is, is a very, is a, again, is another no-brainer. It's the idea of taking plots of land and, and readjust that and, and, and sharing the, uh, the uh, and releasing some land when you do that to the, to uh, um, be sold to fund all the infrastructure that actually promoted the, evaluation, the valorization of that land. Um, if you want, I can come back to that. If, but I, I, I would assume that most of you know about what land readjustment is, how do you use it as a, as a value capture scheme. But in Colombia, they, they have been doing this uh, in, in many ways there, in particularly in Medellin. Um, urban operations like uh, Puerto Madero in, in, uh, in um, in uh, Buenos Aires, they basically use public land to sort of uh, promote uh, this huge development that changed basically, uh, they, they promoted a huge, a basic, a, a, a strong change in the inner city uh, of, uh, this is taking a old abandoned port and uh, using that land for a new development. Um, transfer development rights, this is, uh, since many people are interested in the transportation thing, let me go quick on that. This is, oh shoot, <laughs> sorry for the, this is funding, it is very sensitive here. <laughs> uh, it's not me. <laughs> I'm sensitive, but, uh, but, uh, <laughs> but this is uh, what Porto Alegre did when they needed to expand a big avenue through, uh, through the city. Um, they, uh, um, they paid uh, for the expropriation with development rights for the land, for the owners to use somewhere else or they could actually sell it. There was a market for it, for that. And they, with that scheme, they managed to, to fund ba uh, about 65% of all the land that they needed to buy for that, for that big avenue with that scheme. It's pretty, it's, in other words, it's a city creating a currency to actually, to actually uh, uh, do the expropriations. Uh, so that be without having to use their own cash. Uh, um, you could only do that, of course, if you have some kind of a development uh, of um, limitations of, of development rights in certain areas that you could use the, the, uh, whatever you're, you're transferring. Otherwise, you know, you, you, the instrument doesn't work. Um, um, public land procurement. This is a, this is a very interesting topic about how do the public buys land. Colombia has, has figured out an interesting, and actually has this scheme in, the, in this law 388. It was something that was passed without much, much convulsion in, uh, around that. And this is basically the, the notion that when the public acquires land for any public project, it will always acquire the land at the value before they announce another project. And that makes a huge difference because most of the time you pay twice. And, and, this is, and, and this is the instrument that has actually been used. I don't know if you're, I'm making myself clear, I'm, I'm getting through in what I'm saying. Um, okay. In other regions, there are a number of other instruments like land value increment tax, Korea, Taiwan, impact and development fees. I guess David is going to uh, uh, mention that. Uh, changes in building rights, uh, uh, charges to building rights. as a profond legal de densité in, in France. This is actually what that inspired the, the selling of building rights in Sao Paulo in Brazil in general. Urban operations like in Zax, the zone de amanagement de concerté. Uh, 
leasing, land leasing, TIF, um, again, they're going to be covered by, by, by David, special districts, land banks, expropriation, preemption, right? These are all instruments that do some of the job. And, and, and the, the question, the, the main issue is uh, how, how do you use and when any of them. But before we get there, uh, and let me just very quickly say that there is some, something common about most of these uh, instruments. First, the, uh, the generating fact is land value increment, but it could be the past, could be the present, it could be the future even. Some of the instruments apply to the past if, uh, uh, um, land value increments, some of them and, and, and the, uh, the increments to happen in the future, like in CPAX, for instance. Um, is associated to the immediate urban benefit. It's a payment that's not always in money. It's not necessarily in, in, in money that uh, you, you recover some of the value. It, they are ad hoc, they are not permanent. This is another important thing. And the objective, as I mentioned before, is not necessary to raise revenues. Um, there is an, an, a number of these the inter instruments, are different instruments apply in different circumstances, land uses, uh, uh, for the instances for existing and new ones, uh, projects that are single or multiple projects, so the payment may be involuntary, may be negotiated. There are a number of circumstances how these uh, uh, the value captures uh, and the incidence of value capture uh, occurs. And, and there is no one size fits all, that's obvious to say, right? Uh, um, so the, for instance, if you have with existing infrastructure, existing land use, you're not changing that, the property tax probably makes more sense. Uh, if you're existing infrastructure, the new, new land uses, selling or building rights may be a, a good idea. New uh, infrastructure with existing land use, betterment contributions, typical of the case and new infrastructure with new land use, land readjustment, and you could expand that thing for, 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 uh, for most of these instruments. Um, here's some, how, how am I doing? 10 minutes, okay, I think I'm on the right time then. Thank you. Um, I'm not gonna talk about Columbia because it's, it's widely known, people know a lot about Columbia and betterment contribution, they've been doing this since uh, 1921, this is one of the and, and they have been, there. sometimes that in Colombia, they, they, uh, a betterment contribution has funded about 60% of the, uh, of the local revenues, and this has been going up and down over the time. But I, I would like to spend, uh, talk about Cuenca. Cuenca is a, is, is a city in, in Ecuador that has been using it, and it's not widely known. And that, then I would talk about the selling and building rights in Brazil, and then CPACs. Um, in Cuenca, is over the last 10 years, about 1,800 public works projects funded by betterment contribution. People say, oh, betterment contribution, you can't do it. It's technically impossible. People don't reject that. It's not true. Just try to do it. Revenues, about, it's not much for, on the, for, a Canadian, on the, for a Canadian point of view, but it's $200 per capita. It's quite a bit for, for a, uh, Latin American countries. It's actually more than, than Colombia than, uh, that had been collected in Bogota. And uh, um, it's about $106 million for, that was sufficient to, to pave about 270 kilometers in, in, in the city. 90% of the households paying that, uh, sort of li uh, uh, liquidating the, 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 um, the debts in, in less than four years. 95% of the projects collecting 6% in, in, in uh, betterment contribution and only 3% of non-compliant. I mean, this is quite, quite, quite good indica indicators here. Um, linkages. I think I mentioned that. It, it's, uh, um, uh, let, let's go to the uh, selling of building rights. Um, this, is, this notion um, it started uh, to be discussed in Brazil in 1976, and it was very uh, influenced by the French Plafond Legal de Densité. This is basically establishing a, a, a level of, of building rights that, a, that comes with, a land, with, with um, owning a property, and whatever the city concedes after that, you charge for that. Um, and it, in the 90s, you, uh, we started with the urban operations, and this principle has been included in the uh, new Brazilian constitution uh, uh, of 1988 in two articles, and then again in the city statute of 2001. So th this, is a, this is a case of Curitiba that many of you may know. So basically, what, what, what am I saying? Again, this, this is a sensitive guy, isn't it? <laughs> uh, oh. So this is a very graphic exposition of, um, of, 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 uh, of charging of building rights. This developer here, he wanted to make the case of what, what he had, had the right and what he did have to buy the rights from the city. 
So he built, and, and, and up to this four, uh, fifth floor here, basically, um, he built with the right he had. And the additional he had to buy from the city, and this guy, I'm sorry. Um, so they have to pay. So there's a, you basically, when you use this kind of instrument, you establish what is the, uh, the, uh, um, the um, FAR that is, that is acceptable for that zone of the city, and whatever uh, uh, above that you, you, you charge. Um, Sao Paulo, by the way, this is a couple of weeks ago, and this is what they've been doing over the last eight, eight years, actually, actually a little bit, no, actually since 2002. And uh, they started to, to reduce the, uh, the building rights. And now, they, the whole city, if you own land, you own, you have the, an FAR of one. Everything else, anything else, anything above, over and above that FAR of one, you have to buy from the city. And you die, buy this in urban operation, this is when you, 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 uh, your property is in a, in a major restructuring, or individually when you, uh, by on, on an individual basis of plot by plot. This is when we call it otorga onerosa direito de conserva. It's, it's uh, the, um, the charge, um, um, the um, chargeable uh, right of build. Otorga onerosa. <laughs> Sorry. Otorga onerosa. Is there any Brazilians here, anyone that speaks Portuguese? How do you translate otorga onerosa? <laughs> I, I, I never found a, a, a good translation for that. Now, it's, uh, it's charging at a cost for development rights. Okay, this is the instrument that's being used. They, or, uh, the, the, there was a more vulgar uh, terminology, is um, solo criado, created land. This is, used to be uh, referred to that. Um, so uh, the city of Sao Paulo, just to have an idea, since 2004 have collected already $762 million in, uh, um, in building rights, just in building rights selling on, on the individual base. This is nothing for you Canadians, um, in particular from Toronto, but in Sao Paulo it's some money, and uh, we could do something with that. Um, um, and it's increasing. Um, the, um, last year there was a bad year for, for, sorry, two years ago was a bad year for, for Torga. They collected $130 million. Um, is it more or less clear what I'm saying? Uh, what are CPACs? CPACs is a, sort of a sophistication on, 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 on that scheme that I was suggesting now. The, the, these are certificates of additional development potential. It's a bond issued by the municipality, yet not implying public debt. I, I mean, it, this was a big legal issue, right? because normally when you issue some of these bonds on, on the rights that the city has, people say, well, this creates public debts, and this has an, uh, it opens a gate for, for all kinds of other, but it doesn't. It, it, it's, not, it's not something that the city uh, creates a debt when it issues them. It's something that is only when, um, there is a major legal discussion where the selling of building rights is a tribute, uh, a tax, or is a, simply a right that you may or not use if you want to use, you have to, the city may have the right to collect. And this has gone through the, uh, to the Supreme Court in Brazil, and, and the uh, Supreme Court has, has defined it, uh, has given the, the defined uh, word on that. It's sold electronically. These are in auctions, these certificates. Um, the city issues these certificates, uh, say, take a, a, a big area of the city, say that this area of the city has, um, has the potential to, once the, all the investments on the restructuring that you're doing there, to build, say, uh, uh, in excess of the existing one, something like five million uh, square meters. Okay, you're gonna issue now five million CPACs. Each square meter is worth one CPAC, one CPAC is issued, and the city may be releasing them at will over time. So, of course, they don't sell it at once. They sell in trenches, say, um, a thousand today, uh, or should I say, five hundred thousand today, uh, another hundred thousand the other day, and they so you have a sequence of these auctions, so the city can sort of be uh, testing testing the market, and, and with that they, they make much more money. Um, it's it was created in '95 and, and was sanctioned by the statute of the city in in 2001. It's heavily controlled. It's heavily controlled uh, uh, instrument. The uh, the equivalent to the Security and Com uh, Exchange Commission 
does oversight the, 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 uh, the issuing and the, it, because it's actually sold actually in the stock market. And, and there is a secondary market for that. It's minimal, it, it's a possibility, but people normally don't, normally they simply buy and use it directly. Um, just a, an overview of that. Um, it's used in urban operation. I explained already what urban operations are. It's a bond issue to, uh, um, to uh, use to acquire additional building rights or actually to changes in land uses as well. And in Sao Paulo, only two major urban operations generated already $2.5 billion. And, about, and there is a, uh, some, uh, the city has about 16 of these operations. Not all of them will generate the, this much of CPEX uh, uh, revenues, because, uh, and this has to do with, with uh, where it's located and things like that. But it's quite a bit of money. It's, um, I know that, again, for Toronto's standards, Two billion and a half is is peanuts, but for us it's not, it's not peanuts. Uh, 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 in, in Brazil, it's quite a bit. And in Rio, the um, the uh, um, I'll show you very quickly, and I promise uh, this is the uh, the major reform of the uh, the Port Era Rio, and it's about a four billion dollars project that has been. And this is they've been using CPEX, but they're, they they. The Cash Economic is a social bank of Brazil, a housing bank, bought all, all of them in, in, one, in, one, uh, in, in one payment from Rio. I, I can explain the details about that. And so the Cash Economic now holds all, the, the, all these, uh, uh, these rights, but the city got all the money that they needed to, for, for that investment. Um, it's also done in Curitiba, in the, in the Linha Verde project, and that they're finding that is a much smaller scale because this is a project in the urban periphery where there was a sort of a, 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 um, a, a ring road around Curitiba that not, the city sort of engulfed that thing and that area is being, being uh, uh, embedded in, 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 in the city fabric. Um, this is basically what we're talking about. Um, Again, um, and I'm think this is a notable case of of, uh, of CPEX in, in, in the case of Sao Paulo. Uh, it's interesting that it's being used. For instance, this is a brand. The, the, this is social housing built in one of the highest value areas of of Sao Paulo. For a, some slum areas, there was within that urban operation fully funded by CPEX. CPEX generated so much money that they did not anticipate it that the money that they can't use because they simply don't have, it has to be used within the country by law. It cannot be used outside the urban operation. It's generating about $300 million of interest every year, just of the money not used. So it's, um, it's quite a bit. Uh, lessons, um, revenues are still short of potential. We, low, we have a long way to go, of course. Yet some relevant experiences, and it's, it's particularly relevant when you look not, compare not to the total revenues of the city, but you compare to the investment capacity of the city. That it, it changes quite a bit the, uh, the relevance of that. Associated, most of the success story that we have to say is associated with the spin given to the address local needs rather than direct emulation. They don't try to bring in and apply there. Normally it doesn't work. People have succeeded in that. They sort of developed, so created their own spin so that they, these instruments uh, make it work. And the most, the resistance to that comes from the four E's, the ideology, there's major issue there, I'm not going to go into that, interest, social uh, land owners' interest, uh, the stakeholders, inertia, and, but most of all, the ignorance. People still have uh, ignore the fundamentals of that, and many times they block the thing out of full. And uh, I'll give you one, um, one of the major issues that we, every time you have a discussion on this topic, say, well, you don't, you, if you, any charges on land values are going to inflate the uh, uh, property prices, it will reduce the market, it will make uh, housing more costly, and things like that. And these are completely baloney, and, 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 and people don't understand that. And that because of that, uh, uh, there is a lot of, 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 of resistance to some of these instruments. Thank you very much, and sorry for using all the time. So much time. Thank you, Martin. That was a very interesting gallop around the uh, world of land value capture. And I think Martin's one of the few people I know who can manage to get sex into that otherwise rather uninteresting subject. Anyway, obviously, Martin's taken us around the world and particularly uh, focusing on South America. And I think now a little bit closer to home, I anticipate, uh, David will be talking to us a little bit more about the Canadian experience. Please welcome David Amborski. Thank you, Paul. It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon to speak about this topic and also to be with my uh, old friend and colleague, Martim. Um, 
I'm going to be talking about land value capture in the context of uh, the Canadian experience and just want to cover some applications. I'm not going to cover them in detail, but I'm trying to point out that this is something that has been going on for some period of time. Um, some of these tools have been used. Um, when our team and I did our paper uh, around 2000, we talked about the fact that some tools are tied specifically, you're trying to capture land value. Other tools inadvertently capture land value and they have other purposes at heart. So some of these have been used in the Canadian context for a long period of time and maybe their true potential as a land value capture tool hasn't always been always been applied. So I'm going to give a little bit of an overview of this and uh, cover a few topics and hopefully we can maybe have some discussion afterwards. First of all, I want to give a little typology of, uh, of, of how you can categorize the Canadian tools. And then I want to focus on four different areas just briefly. And I've selected these either because they're current policy issues or because I think they have some specific potential application. Uh, development charges, of course, are being reviewed as our density bonuses by the province. That started about a year ago. Nothing's come out yet, but these are tools that need to be clarified, I think. Tax increment financing, of course, has a high profile because of our transit issues and smart track. Uh, public land leasing is something I think has been ignored to a large extent from a policy perspective. I think it has a lot of potential applications uh, for public agencies in Toronto, and I wanted to focus on that for a little bit. Um, then a few comments about land value capture tools for transit finance, and again, that in detail. You guys from Metrolinx are looking at that in detail, but for those of you who aren't delving in detail, a few comments are relevant here. And then just a few comments on how you should evaluate these tools, some of the components for the evaluation, what we should need to do to try and look at the approach to evaluate how successful they are, whether or not they're fair or equitable. Um, Michelle Altman, I think she referred to earlier, um, she's done an interesting paper in which she had developed a typology for tools. She talked about macro tools that are basically broad interventionist regimes, sometimes in the national government. This would include things like land banking and things like broad land lease programs. There's direct capture tools that kind of recognize uh, the need to capture land value, either from a moral or legal basis, and they want to capture part of that wealth created. And then there are indirect tools, there are sometimes local tools that sometimes inadvertently collect, capture land value as well. And again, just some of the key examples uh, on the macro tools, we have land banking. We've had land banking in place in some jurisdictions, um, in municipalities across Canada and Alberta and Saskatchewan. We have some land banking actually applications. You could almost argue that the um, green belt around uh, Ottawa is a land bank approach. Uh, we've had examples of, of public land leasing. We have some examples of community land trusts. All these are tools that have been used in the Canadian context. In terms of direct tools, we have density bonuses. We know those well in the city of Toronto. The development charges. We have inclusionary zoning in some cities. It really is a form or a spin-off from density bonuses. And we have indirect tools, uh, such as tax increment financing and things like public-private partnerships. This isn't... Uh, a comprehensive list that's illustrative of the kinds of tools we use in these areas. And one of the things that should become pretty obvious from our team's presentation and what I'm saying is that these tools sometimes bleed into each other. The terms used and definitions sometimes uh, overlap with each other and sometimes a tool by some name and how it's applied in different jurisdictions vary. There's various applications of density bonuses of TIF and so on and so forth. So we have to be very careful when you start analyzing or talk about them to specifically explain how they work in the implementation. And as many policy tools, when they fail, they often fail because of the implementation, either being structured wrong or being poorly done in some fashion. Um, just quickly on development charges. We have development charges across Canada. We have Ontario development charges we've had in place for a long period of time. The Act came into place in 1990. British Columbia has development cost charges. Alberta has some uh, applications that are smaller in nature, and Nova Scotia has delved into this, particularly around the city of Halifax. So it's a tool we use. Now, development charges do capture land value because, obviously, when a plot of land is serviced, as my team pointed out, the value increases. So although the idea is often trying to charge for it at some price, it is capturing part of that land value. Um, the other application in some jurisdictions is an alternative to this, is a land development tax that rather being based on the cost of pricing might be based on the value of the land or increased value of the land. In an Ontario context, as I mentioned before, DCs are under review. We're, some people are proud to say we have the highest 
DCs or impact fees in North America. Some jurisdictions are 60,000 per single family home. I personally think we're reaching a tipping point on this. I think it affects affordable housing. It affects the ability to attract a workforce that in turn has an impact on attracting industry to that area. So I think we have to look at this from that perspective as well. Um, it means we can use other tools to raise some of the revenues. And part of this uh, land value capture is related to the question of incidents. I don't have time to go into it today, but there's two dis different applications or theories on the incidence of development charges and impact fees. Um, they're based on slightly different applications of, of, of theory, and they have slightly different outcomes. So the question is which one applies to us, but we don't have time to get into that today. If people are interested, I can cite you to the literature that looks at these aspects. Um, the second consideration is density bonuses. And again, uh, Aaron Moore here at the Monk Center did a comprehensive study of density bonuses as a tool in Toronto and looking at Vancouver. And again, these aren't anything new. We go back to Chicago and New York, going back to 1959. Uh, we have many US cities that have applied density bonuses. And again, they come in many different forms. They can be as of right, you're allowed to get a density bonus if you make some kind of contribution, or they can be negotiated on a one-off basis. They also can be density bonus where payments are made in cash, or they can be made in-kind contribution, or they can be a combination of the two. So again, many variations. Uh, another variation of this is something Martin mentioned in some jurisdictions called a linkage fee, where this applies to commercial office space specifically, and that if you want to get a higher density, you have to make a contribution to affordable housing. Actually, the City of Toronto tinkered with this in the 1990 plan review a group of us at Ryerson are part of looking at that for the city and the province, looking at that potential applications in Toronto. Of course, around that time, you may recall that the commercial office market went bust, so it didn't make any sense to apply that tool, which points out the fact that you can't use these tools in the absence of market considerations. You have to look at the market and see if they're going to work in the context of the market and what's happening in, in the various jurisdictions. Um, in the Canadian context, um, it's not only Toronto and Ontario that has use density bonuses, but also British Columbia has applications. There they use a different term called community amenity agreements. And of course, in the Ontario setting, we know them as Section 37 contributions that are based on the Planning Act. Um, in BC, um, one of the things that I wasn't aware of initially, we look at, when you look at these comparisons, when Aaron looked at them, when I looked at them, we look at the Vancouver case as being preferable as far as I'm concerned to what we have in Toronto because they use a more transparent process of trying to capture a certain percentage of the increased value based on a pro forma that's shared between the developer and the city and they negotiate that with staff. Here are more at the vagaries of political negotiation and intervention. So I thought the Vancouver system was much better, but that's only under the Vancouver Charter. Actually, other cities in the province have a much more um, let's say, random approach, and use different approaches in places like Coquitlam and Burnaby, which is quite different. And again, they're trying to straighten out their legislation as well. Um, so that's a little issue there of things need to be looked at in improvement. In Ontario, you know, we talk about the Toronto case, but it's used in other places. Burlington's used it for some period of time. More recently, Oakville and Vaughan moved into it in Ottawa. And again, they have different ap approaches and applications. And again, there's our, um, I would dare say, a, a little more transparent and understandable than the uh, Toronto cases. But again, there's need for improvement. And again, this is part of the review that's going on provincially. And hopefully we have some improvements to the way value is captured using this particular tool. Um, this brings me to the next topic of tax increment financing. And again, uh, tax increment financing has had broad applications in the US and Canadian applications. And again, this is one of those tools that comes under many different application implementation depending on the legislation that happens to be in place. And again, it's not anything new. I remember one of the reporters in the press uh, about six years ago said, TIFF's great, we can use it to take down the Gardner Expressway. No, I don't think so. It doesn't generate that much revenue. And it's been applied for a long time in the US. Since 1952 in California, it's had application over 48 space states. States have had it in, taken it out, made changes, and so on. It's got a broad variety of names and applications. But I want to call your attention to one of the components that appears in at least 20 of the states. And that's something called the but-for test. Because TIF is based on the fact that 
if you want to raise revenue, what you can do is create a TIF district. You can identify the kinds of improvements you want in that dif district, and then you have a baseline of what the property tax assessment is at that point in time. You can float a TIF bond to pay for those infrastructure improvements, and then the increased property taxes above that baseline over a period of time will flow back to pay off the TIF bond. So it's a revenue stream coming back to pay back with infrastructure improvements. The but-for test in some states argues that but for that infrastructure, the land value increase wouldn't take place. But for the building of the transit line in the station, the land value wouldn't increase. Enid and I did a case study for the province before we brought legislation in place in the West Donlands, and there is very clear because of the flood problem, but for putting in the stormwater attenuation for the Don River, that land value wouldn't increase because you couldn't build that. So I think the but for case is a really test is a very important part of TIF and TIF legislation. And some people have argued, um, our team and I have had a discussion, well, TIF's really not a land value capture tool because it's moving around the property tax. I think when you have a but-for test, that, that investment in infrastructure does create an uplift, and you're capturing that uplift, and I think it does apply in those particular situations. Um, TIF, again, is not anything only applied in Ontario. Winnipeg in the city has applied a TIF. It was actually done under the, the uh, mayor's tenure of one of our ministers. Anybody know who that is? Okay. Pardon? Pardon? <laughs> Glenn Murray. Yeah, Glenn Murray very proudly had, say, had brought TIFs into Winnipeg. Again, they were done in a citywide basis only. In Alberta, we have something called the Community Revitalization Levy. And again, when I called them talking about that the first time, they go, it's not a TIF tool. You look at it, it sure is a TIF tool. Walks like a TIF, quacks like a TIF, it's a TIF, it's a TIF, you know. And they use that extensively in Calgary and they've used it in Edmonton as well, so it's applications. So we have the, the applications and the case studies and the precedents, and of course we have applications in Ontario now because we do have TIF legislation. But one thing I want to do today is I want to draw a distinction between two tools we have here because I find people are confused continually with this. Uh, I even found uh, some senior planners uh, who don't understand the difference between what we have called the TEAG, a tax increment equivalent grant, and a TIF, tax increment financing. Because people, you know, talk to people, go, oh, we've got a TIF here, we've got a TIF there, and they're really talking about TEAG. And they're very different tools. TEAGs were basically um, created under Section 28 of the Planning Act under the Community Improvement Plan. And basically, these are targeted towards uh, brownfield remediation and development. Um, one of the things that occurs in the Municipal Act is we're not allowed to give grants or bonuses to municipalities uh, or to property owners from the city. So the only exception to that is if you have a community improvement plan put in place, then you can give grants to property owners, as you did under the NIP and RAP program, some of you may remember some years ago. So the province created a program where you could have tax equivalent equivalent grants for people who wanted to remediate brownfield properties. But the first thing was, the precondition was you had to have a community improvement um, plan. And the classic case of this, the first one to use was the race program in Hamilton. And the idea is that um, much like much like a TIF application is the post-development increase in property tax that are generated creates a benefit that is returned to, in this case, the property owner. And basically, um, a percentage of that increase in value is given back over 10 years to help pay for the cost of remediation. So in a Teague program, the benefit goes back to the property owner directly for brownfield remediation. In a TIF program, the funds are used to create community benefits or community infrastructure. So that difference is very, very important. And again, I keep talking to people who don't know the difference, so I wanted to try and make that, make that clear today. Um, I thought it was somewhat important. Um, again, in a TIF case, we had the pilot studies were done. Uh, Ian and I worked on those in the province of West Donlands, so we did a study for East Bayfront. We showed, guess what, TIFs work. Uh, we gave some provisos, though, that one of the things on the West Donlands was that the assessments there were quite low and out of date. There was, there was provincially owned land. 
Uh, provincial legislation was brought in 2006. The problem is the regulations haven't come forward to my knowledge yet. Uh, and that's a lost opportunity. Because there's no regulations, I think they haven't been taken advantage of. Again, opportunities are lost. Once you don't move forward, you can't apply TIF applications in New York's Padina Expressway. If you want to go to Ottawa, the Ottawa Transit System, Kitchener Waterloo, all had opportunities for TIFs, uh, never undertaken. But TIFs have other applications as well as transit. The other application that was very interesting was in Markham. In Markham, of course, at the Markham Center, trying to have a, um, a walkable and desirable built form for the Markham Center plan, they wanted to create employment opportunities, but they didn't want to permit surface parking. So they're trying to attract employers in Markham because the cost of, of trying underground parking was prohibited. They said, okay, come on in office developers, we have to put underground parking. That made it very expensive as compared to sites you know, down the road, a little outside of the Markham Center. So that was prohibitive in attracting employment uses. So the then CAO, John Livy, had an idea. What if we use a TIF to create a parking authority? We use a parking authority funds to develop some structured parking, and that would be a way of relieving the parking requirements for the office space. We could have shared parking facilities, be able to track employment opportunities. Well, the regulations weren't there, and it, it wouldn't work because the legislation wasn't clear enough without the regulations to make it happen, so it never happened. So I'm pointing out that the TIF can be used for other planning applications other than the transit ones that we often, often talk about in this particular case. And of course, the smart track is the one we all know today that is part of the, the policy agenda of the city and moving forward. So um, I'm not gonna talk about that in detail, but you can raise questions, we're gonna talk about that after. The last um, kind of specific tool I want to talk about is public land leasing. And again, um, there have been scared applications of this around Crown Lands, Toronto Islands, Toronto Portlands has a number of leases, but there's no well-developed policy and people often don't think about the ways this can be used. And my view is that using land leases can create a revenue stream rather than selling off assets. Too often governments want to balance their current books they sell land. Um, so it loses opportunities to do joint parking facilities. It loses opportunities because you can't control the land use. It loses opportunities of keeping something in public use for a longer period of time. York University got their land from the province for a buck. Was that four or five years ago? They sold some of their land for housing. Why didn't they lease it? It's a multi-generational institution. In 75 years, they may need it for expansion. You know, it makes more sense to me than selling off the land to balance your books in the short run. Um, TTC was selling off lands. Why don't they do joint development or land leases um, around their sites, take advantage of it? Right now, the Toronto District School Board, they have a mandate to sell off sites, to balance the budget. What happens if in 15 or 20 years we have a recycling of, of demography and we need those lands for school sites or we keep them in community as aspects for different purposes? What about the need to uh, use those sites for affordable housing in the short run? Uh, can maintain those community assets. Actually, my, our students at Ryerson are doing a studio project on that topic right now with the TDSB as a client, so they're looking at these opportunities. Um, public land leasing creates joint development opportunities, and that can be used for transit as well. So all of the public land leasing applications, I think, have a lot of potential and haven't been looked at as they should be in the, in the Toronto case. So I think there's something that has some great, great opportunities. And again, you know, there's great examples internationally. Um, again, they're very different. They're macro examples. Hong Kong, almost everything here is on land lease. Amsterdam, the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy has a great book on land leasing around the world, looking at a number of applications. Um, we even have uh, one of my favorite examples I like to speak about is Massport in Boston, which is Mass Transportation or Mass um, State Agency. And when lands became available and accessible because of the big dig, they had a big track of land on the waterfront. And what they were able to do was they actually put in infrastructure, floated bonds for infrastructure, then they began leasing the land to create the revenue streams to pay back the infrastructure. So they have a number of significant uh, developments on the waterfront where they have revenue flows coming in. And some of the other sites have also provided housing, condos built on leased land. So that opportunity is there as well. So there's all kinds of opportunities. Uh, in two minutes, I can't tell you all about them, so I gotta keep moving through, sorry. Um, Again, land barrier capture for finance transit. In addition to the above tools, of course, there's special assessments and joint development, public private partnerships that can come into play. Um, you know, Paul talked about London Crossrail. 
Again, there's examples where they use a couple of different tools. In the US, Washington, DC did a lot of joint development, very successful project. Portland did some land leasing. Seattle actually had special assessments that the developers voted to impose on themselves. They knew that without that, the transfer wouldn't happen. They wouldn't get the value uplifts. Lots of examples. Um, so just in kind of winding down, I am going to be on time after all. Okay, amazing. One of the things is that if you're trying to look at the valuation of these various tools, and I like to point these out, how you should apply this to various tools in the way they're applied in the policy structure. One thing is transparency. You want to make sure it's a transparent process so people understand what it is. Uh, some of the TIF projects in the U.S. are criticized in Joan Younger's work of not being very transparent from the Lincoln Institute. Equity, you want to treat all parties relatively fairly. Accountability of the funds. Is the money used what it's intended to be used for? Is it transferring into what should be used for? And then secondly, or thirdly, or fourthly, sorry, the second kind of tier of things are impacts on other policies. You have to think about the way this tool impacts other policies. And then I go back to a couple examples of that. One was that during Mayor Miller's term, um, there was a move to double development charges. There was a move by the finance department. Why? They wanted to raise revenue and make their life easier, okay, to a large extent. That's a cynical approach, of course. I see Don Altman hiding in the back, so I've got to be careful, uh, people from the department. Um, but the point is that there's other issues. Uh, Mayor Miller then has transit city plan, and guess what? The double development charges, the pro forma for those sites along the area you want to transfer and development don't work any longer. So you got to look at all the policy impacts or the impacts of one policy on another. People say, well, we should really look towards having inclusionary zoning. And I haven't looked at detail, just kind of casually, but if you look at those jurisdictions that have inclusionary zoning, they don't have the same high level of exactions for other purposes, development charges, density bonuses that we have. So you have to look at how these things work together. You can't get too much out of one piece. You've got to look at how it works. And the last thing, if you really are trying to raise revenue, you have to look at the revenue capacity of the tool and how it compares to other tools and compare them to each other. So... Just to conclude, um, Canadian jurisdictions have a long history of losing land value capture tools. I've tried to illustrate that to you, and I could even draw it out in more detail. I think there's a need to better understand the impacts on policies and understand the markets, how you have to work with the market to make them work. I gave the example of leakage fees, how they wouldn't work when that market went kind of bust. Um, clearly, the existing tools need to be improved. And they're doing reviews of development charges and density bonuses right now. I think that will be coming into play. And there are, there are really opportunities for applying some of these new tools as well, joint development, land leasing, and also applying TIFs in appropriate fashion if we get that in place. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. That was uh, very interesting. I'm inviting now David and Martin to uh, make themselves available for any questions. And maybe I'd just uh, kick off with one for uh, each of you. Uh, and uh, a fairly brief uh, question with a fairly brief answer, please. Uh, Martin, what's your, uh, what would be your selection for the best land value capture scheme that you've seen? And briefly, just why do you think it is the best? Best for whom? Well, <laughs> best in terms of most effective, most efficient. Um, I think that nowadays the CPACs is pretty, uh, pretty effective. Yeah. Yeah, and it's um, CPEX, uh, the, uh, the way it has been conceived, it's, it's a very sophisticated instrument. It's not best for everybody because you have to have a capital market that works, and so that many smaller cities may not be able to do that. And uh, you have to have a vigorous uh, land market, uh, property development market, actually. And if you don't have that, this is particularly for that, applies for that kind of, uh, of situation. And you have to have uh, also the... Uh, um, the, uh, uh, you're talking about the, an instrument to um, redevelop uh, big zones of the city, big polygons in the city. So for that purpose, specifically, I think it's the best instrument you can think of. Uh, okay, thanks for that. David, what would you say is your best example of one that works really well? Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, density bonuses and capture value very well if they're done properly. I don't think what we have here is transparent and open. I think that can be a very, very useful tool. 
And in some ways, that, that mirrors, it's almost paying for development in the same way as CPAC is. So if you do that properly, uh, I think that's a, that's a very useful tool. I'm not suggesting it's going to generate the most revenue, but I think it has a very transparent opportunity. And I think the people that are willing to make that contribution share that wealth if they know it's a fair and equitable basis they're doing it on. Let me just make a comment here. One of the neat things about CPAC is developers are pretty happy with that. So that they know pretty well that they're not the ones being affected. The landowners are, and they separate quite clear. They have this clear separation who's developing and who's, who's benefiting as a landowner. Yep. So that's, I think it's a very neat uh, uh, aspect. Some of the other instruments are not so clear. Okay, thanks for that, Martin. Right, ladies and gentlemen, over to you. We've got a few minutes for questions now. Uh, would you be kind enough just to state your name and organization before you ask a question, and then uh, let me know who it is that you would like to answer the question. Yes. Gentlemen, at the back now. Hi, I'm Stuart Baker. I'm the Sorry, there's a microphone coming. If you'd be kind enough, just to wait. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm T. Lowe Shaver, doing my PhD in political theory here at U of T. And my question's for uh, Dr. Mborski. So I was wondering if there are any obstacles, legislative or otherwise, towards the wider implementation of land leasing in Toronto or in Ontario or in Canada, or is it just a matter of getting public agencies to think in longer terms rather than short term? I haven't looked at all the details and the legislation, um, but you'll find that, um, again, you know, Toronto Portland has a lot of land leases. Um, the city of Toronto, the Sheraton Center is built, uh, the Sheraton Hotel is built at least land from the city of Toronto. So there are applications out there that are hidden and tied away, but it just seems not to be something that's broadly considered in many, many, many ways. Obviously, land leases have been done by the province as well for various purposes. So it's out there. I think it's a need to look at it, look at it as a tool, kind of promote it and see what it can do and structure the implementation properly. Okay, thanks, David. <clears throat> Any more questions from anybody in the room there? <clears throat> Just whilst we're waiting, I wonder if I could ask a, a question for either of you to answer, really. One of the problems with land value capture is that although there seems to be a bit of a mismatch between uh, the fact that somebody's land may increase in value doesn't necessarily mean they have money in the bank uh, out of which to pay either a tax or an increment or a betterment levy. How do you overcome that difficulty? Yeah, Martin, off you go. Well, and um, with betterment contributions, probably the, the, the <coughs> most uh, sensitive to that kind of, uh, of issue because most of the other ones are associated with benefits that when you realize the benefits of when you pay it. So that's, uh, but with betterment contribution is, uh, um, th there is a solution for that, it's a deferred payment. So you, the, you, uh, um, your property is, uh, um, you, uh, um, is notified about the, uh, the, uh, the charges you're gonna be having, but uh, you, you have, an, but if you can't pay, when you, only when you transact that property is that you pay, and with, of course, interest and all that. And this is a proposal, actually, that, uh, that is, uh, was originally done by Donald Troop, again, the, the same person, and they, apparently they, they, they proposed this thing for, for Los Angeles, actually. Uh, Okay. So it's, a, it's one way of bypassing. But most of these other ones are selling building rights. I think the neat thing and the nice thing about that is that you, won't, you pay when you apply for a license. So it's only when you're actually gonna, gonna benefit from a, a, um, from a change of building rights from the pre-existing one that you pay for that because you're gonna realize for that as you know, it's ipso facto. Okay, David, anything you want it's, to add to that? It's, it's just either, I was going to say the same thing, it's either at time of sale or time of development. When you're doing something to generate additional income, you pay for it. The one exception to that is the extent to which the property tax captures land value. If your property tax assessment go up each year, then of course you're paying for it each year. If a heavy component of the tax is on the land value and your land's going up, then you're stuck making those payments. But then in some jurisdictions are circuit breakers to try and address that particular issue. So. Okay, thanks. Uh, any more questions from the floor? Yes, gentleman on the left there. Just wait for the microphone if you'd be so kind. Thank you. Do we really understand uh, who pays uh, these taxes, whether it's the developer, the landowner, or the ultimate uh, consumer of, the, uh, of whatever real estate asset is produced? And uh, do we really understand how it may prevent uh, desirable development or suppress it. Okay. David, do you want to have a pop at that? He's looking at me. <laughs> well, I mean, that, that's the question. It depends, uh, you know, let me, let me go to the development charges. I, didn't, I was trying not to get into this, but I will. Um, 
One of, one of the theories is to look at a development charge like an excise tax, and that one of the points about that is that if developers know a development charge is going to be charged at a certain value prior to purchasing the land, to a large extent it's capitalized the pre-development land values, because they're going to look at uh, a pro forma or a land residual approach to find out what the final market price is and work backwards to determine what they can afford to pay for the land to deliver a profit. If there's increase in development charge, of course, they can't pay, shift those backwards, so they're going to have to push those forward. And that's why when there's a dramatic increase in development charges, developers cry because either you can push them forward if the market's strong, or if the market's not strong, they cut out of profits. The other view of the property tax in a sense that's very popular in the U.S. is that the property tax or the development charge is a replacement for property tax payments. In other words, if there weren't development charges, the um, infrastructure paid for the property tax. Um, since the property taxes are lower because of development charges, because property taxes are longer paying for the infrastructure, the argument is that those benefits are capitalized into house values, not only the new housing being built, but also the existing housing. So it raises house prices. Now, um, to me, I, I subscribe to the earlier view in Ontario, mostly because of the fact that we are a very sophisticated development industry and people tend to know basically what most of the development charge is. We also have pretty uniform standards. We're not gold plating additional services, sometimes doing the states when they get extra money from development charges compared to here. So there's, there's two theories, and it's a little bit up in the air right now. We haven't proven which one is the most accurate one in our context. Okay, Martin, is there anything you want to add? Yeah, uh, uh, let me make a, a uh, first comment, a, a very general one, and it has to do with, the, in an economic sense, David Ricardo is pretty well established that any charges on, on land badges uh, falls necessarily on the landowner. So it's, it's, you cannot transfer to, to uh, this is the way, it has to do with the, how land prices are determined in the first place. So most of these charges that uh, uh, technically any charge on, on land that, on, uh, that ultimately uh, uh, falls into the land rents, uh, land values if you want, um, necessarily falls into the, uh, to the uh, um, landowners. Now, in practice, um, it's, it's a hard sell. A lot of people don't believe that. A lot of people have a lot of dollars, and, 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 and then this is mostly because it, uh, uh, from this strictly statistical point of view, it's very difficult to demonstrate. And, and the, it's very hard to find a natural experiment to actually demonstrate that. But we have some, some indications here and there that, that charges on land values um, the, uh, of, of many kinds have actually capitalized some of that in land prices. The problem is, is you, you never, again, you never see a, a, a pure situation. So, um, for instance, in Colombia, there has been, uh, they have an, an instrument there that's similar to the one that I'm referring to uh, in, in Sao Paulo, and that is, uh, uh, they call it participación en plusvalías. This means that every time that you change either uh, um, land, uh, rural to urban land, or densities, or zoning, the 50% uh, um, of the land value, and they, how do they calculate that? This is, and this is, again, this is the major challenge that you have on most of these instruments. How do you calculate exactly what are the benefit that you're actually uh, accruing and that, you, you're, that, uh, that you're supposed to pay? And, and I'll, I'll put this, this, this question on, on the side one moment. But uh, um, in the case of, of Colombia, they charge between 30 to 50% of that only. And they calculate that land value, and this is a assessor uh, issue, or by, on a comparative uh, uh, method. They, they look at the other places that have the same type of, of, of zoning rights are comparable and see what's the value of that, and then that, that difference is what they, they, they collect. Now, where they applied some of that in, in, in Bogota, there has been some research showing that the charges were not transferred in, uh, uh, to the prices, they were actually absorbed by the land. And the land prices that uh, developers were paying for, for, la for land owners for their developments were lower than, than before that. So that is, uh, and there is some, some indication. And we're actually very interested in here, uh, to, to find a, a place where we could, and the Lincoln Institute actually is actually very interested in funding <laughs> some research of someone that could find a natural experiment to actually do that. And it's very hard to, to do that. Um, now, uh, um, Martin, I just need, we're running out of time. Can I just see whether there's one last question that anybody would like to ask? Yes, gentleman in the middle there. If you just wait for the microphone, and again, if you'd just be kind enough to give us your name and your organization, please. 
Uh, yes, my name is Rishi Luca. I'm a master's student at Ryerson. Uh, this is a question for Professor Amborski. Um, in the context of Toronto, uh, MPAC is supposed to be revenue neutral. Um, I'm just very curious of, by implementing TIF, how that might impact our ability to pay for services in the future and the growth of those services in the future, and how that interplays a little bit with the way that MPAC is supposed to work. Okay, David? I'm not sure what MPAC being revenue neutral has to do with that question, but I think your question is more if we have TIFs that will impact our ability to pay for services. Um, the question is then whether TIF is diverting revenues that would otherwise be directed towards city, other city expenditures. And the point is that once a TIF bond is paid off, all the money goes back into the public revenue. A TIF bond could be a 15-year bond or a 20-year bond, and the argument would be that Presumably that money wouldn't come uh, otherwise if you have the but-for test, but that's not entirely true. Maybe, maybe it would come. Maybe some of the development would take place, so you may lose some revenues. Uh, I can, but I could, um, I could quote my colleague Ian Slack and say property taxes are pretty low in the city anyhow. There's, there's room to raise property taxes. I, I agree with her very clearly on that. If you, if you looked at the, uh, the tax rates in the city of Toronto residential as compared to other jurisdictions in 905, you can see our rates are relatively low. There is some room. There's just not political motivation. I'm intrigued to notice that uh, David obviously has planted all his students in the audience to ask the questions that he can <laughs> shine in the answers. Now, Martin has a very quick comment he wants to make just before we wrap up. No, a, this is to address the issue. That one of the neat things about CPACs is that it, it very elegantly resolved this dramatic academic problem how to, to calculate that and that is through auction. You auction the value and people pay what they, what, what they think is worth. And, and so it, it resolves, it addresses the, in, in a very elegant way a v very fundamental problem of value capture. How do you actually calculate that? And you say, well, you auction that and let the market decide. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you found the presentations this evening interesting and informative and I appreciate, obviously, it's a very live issue here in Toronto. So I hope you found the contribution of our two eminent speakers very helpful. Would you join me in thanking them both? I'll hand back to Enid. Well, thank you, Paul, for moderating uh, the session this afternoon. But, Martim, I have to say that $2.5 billion for Toronto is a lot of money. <laughs> so if we could find a way to... Feel that. U.S. <laughs> to 2.5 billion U.S., so, so I think that would actually solve a lot of our problems. Um, so I, I, I would like to say thank you to Paul for moderating today, Martim and David uh, for their discussion. Um, I would also like uh, the staff to thank the staff of the Monk School who've been wandering around, uh, who've let you in and made sure the audio works. The, and uh, thank you to them. Thank you to um, our IMFG staff, Dina Grazer and Stella Kiriakakis. Um, just to let you know that today's session was webcast uh, and it will be on our website probably in a week or two. Uh, so if you missed something or someone you know missed the session today, they can watch the webcast. So again, thank you all for coming out on this very snowy day. Thank you. Hey, how are you doing?